just a moment. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Major General Pat Ryder, Pentagon Press Secretary. Thanks very much for joining us for today's briefing and update on the Department of Defense recruiting efforts. As you know, the military, the U.S. military, is the strongest fighting force on Earth. For more than 50 years, our all-volunteer force has been sustained by qualified patriots who stand up to serve and keep our republic secure. As Secretary of Defense Austin has said, our greatest strategic asset is our people. We must continue to recruit and retain the best that our country has to offer. The department remains deeply committed to ensuring that every qualified patriot has the opportunity to answer the call. We're fortunate to have with us today a panel of defense leaders to discuss today's recruiting environment and preview the service's goals for fiscal year 25. Dr. Katie Helen, DOD's Director of Military Accession Policy, Major General Johnny Davis, Commanding General, United States Army Recruiting Command in Fort Knox, at Fort Knox, Brigadier General Christopher Amrine, Commander, Air Force Recruiting Service, Rear Admiral James Waters III, Commander, Navy Recruiting Command, and Major General William Bowers, Commanding General, Marine Corps Recruiting Command. As a reminder, today's briefing is on the record. I'll turn it over to each of our panelists for brief opening remarks before opening it up to Q&A. And please note, I will call on reporters and try to get to as many of you as possible. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Helen to kick things off. Good afternoon. I am Katie Helen, the Director of Accession Policy. Thank you for inviting me to this media roundtable. And I'd like to start uh, by expressing a special thank you to everyone over the past year, from our recruiting commanders, to our recruiters, to our MEPCOM personnel, who've contributed to the success of fiscal year 2024 recruiting missions following significant shortfalls during the previous years. The military service concluded fiscal year 2024 in a much improved position compared to this time last year, despite a continuously challenging and disinterested recruiting market. At the end of September, the service has enlisted just shy of 225,000 new recruits in fiscal year 2024. That's over 25,000 more than fiscal year 2023. Furthermore, the services had a 35% increase in contracts written compared to this time last year. US MEPCOM saw a year-over-year -year increase of medical exam by 48% and the active component started fiscal year 2025 with a 10% larger starting pool or a delayed entry program pool compared to this time last year. OSD and the services will continue to build off the momentum that we've gained in 2024. Nevertheless, we need to remain cautiously optimistic about the future recruiting operations as we continue to recruit in a market that has low youth propensity to serve, limited familiarity with military opportunities, a competitive labor market, and a declining eligibility among young adults. More specifically, we've observed over the last decade a growing divide between military and civilians. Data indicate that many of today's youth are not interested in military service and have many misperceptions about what life is like as a service member. Additionally, for the first time since this metric has been tracked, the majority of youth have never even considered military service as an option. That is, it's not even on the radar. This divide has been brought about by a confluence of many factors, including the shrinking military footprint and declining veteran presence across society. Young Americans now have fewer direct ties to a family member or a close friend who has served in the military. For example, in 1990, 40% of our young adults had a parent who served. That's down to 15% today. In the past, those direct ties were key to conveying the boundless opportunities and experiences that are gained from military service. And without these personal connections, we find fewer young adults are familiar with the benefits of service. Further complicating our recruiting challenges is the low number of youth who are qualified for military service. Data show nearly 77% of youth between the ages of 17 and 24 are not qualified for military service without some type of waiver. This is where programs like our Medical Accession Records Pilot, or MARP, and service member prep courses have been helpful to expand the market. But we also seek to expand the market by reconnecting with young adults and their influencers on the value proposition of service. For instance, the next generation of Americans to serve should know that there has never been a better time for them to choose military service. Youth today seek a larger purpose in their lives and desire jobs where they have greater participation in decision making and can create a direct, tangible impact. Military service offers all of this. 
Service provides new perspectives, a sense of purpose, the opportunity to take on great responsibilities, and challenge the status quo. Service members find personal fulfillment in serving in every part of the world, responding with skills to truly make a difference. Military service has more than 250 occupations, where each person will be individually challenged to reach their peak potential by providing a path to success. The military represents one of the most educated organizations in the world across all ranks. We provide our service members with competitive pay packages and benefits such as retirement savings and health care, along with unprecedented opportunities for continued education and training. We offer these things that the young adults today look for when choosing a career, but in many respects they just don't know it. Too often the military is falsely seen as an alternative to college or an option of last resort. We are working to reframe this narrative so that Americans understand that military service is a pathway to greater education and career opportunities while defending democracy and the freedoms we hold dear. This is why the Joint Advertising Market Research and Studies Program has launched the digital Calling Answer campaign to build familiarity and with the value proposition of military service to nest with the services specific campaigns. Further, the department's There Tomorrow Adult Influencer Media Campaign targets parents, educators, and other relevant adult influencers to build advocacy for military service. Moreover, we have collaborated with our education partners through our military enlistment data to access to LIFT students or our medals working group with uh, state education agencies to develop a strategy and a plan to share military data with states in order to provide credit to public high schools for military readiness in addition to college and career readiness. We've also partnered with our fellow national service agencies like AmeriCorps and Peace Corps to help amplify a message of service because like military service, there's been a decline in propensity for national service opportunities. So we are working a whole of government solution. While we're here to talk about recruiting efforts today, we also want to celebrate the 225, the 225,000 young adults who've enlisted in fiscal year 2024. Through a spirit of selfless service, we continue to build and maintain the world's most capable military. I uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for your continued efforts to better understand and, the depart and support the department's recruiting mission. I look forward to your questions. Well, good, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. I'm Johnny Davis, uh, U.S. Army Recruiting Commander, and thank you, Dr. Helen, and fellow recruiting commanders uh, for taking the time to be here. As mentioned, the U.S. Army Recruiting Command exceeded our fiscal year 2024 recruiting mission with more than 55,000 future soldiers going to basic combat training. Additionally, our dedicated recruiters capitalized on those momentum and surpassed the fiscal year uh, 24 delayed entry program mission of 5,000, contracting more than 11,000 future enlistments for fiscal year 25. This is a great start and a very positive momentum. Achieving these goals helps ensure our Army has the personnel needed to meet and strength numbers established by Congress. Just over a year ago, the fierce competition for talented Americans and the need to modernize recruiting efforts led the Secretary of the Army to announce recruiting as the Army's number one priority and the need for recruiting transformation. In the past year, we've witnessed historic changes that generated incredible positive momentum for us in the Army. This really started in February 2024 after about a year of putting uh, many of these initiatives together, uh, and, and it hasn't slowed down. Our hardworking recruiters, whole of Army support and transformation initiatives made our fiscal year 24 success possible. We know we are, we are not out of the woods yet, but we remain steadfast to mission success this year and beyond. So as I look back on the past year, I think there are two main contributors to the success we're seeing. Our investment in the recruiting force and their families, and the whole of Army investment in recruiting. We know the importance of putting people first and starting this investment with adapting our recruiter assessment and selection processes. Incor incorporating recruiter feedback, we also revamped training at the recruiting college and added two weeks to our Army recruiting course to focus on people and quality of life. Our People Week brings recruiters and their families virtually together to pre prepare them for the demands of life away from military installations. Our senior leaders supported recruiters with historic incentives in fiscal year 24. Recruiter incentive pay continues. Authority to promote sergeants who graduate the Army recruiting course to staff sergeant. These are all volunteers. Over 927 have been promoted. 
meritoriously promote up to 150 qualified sergeants and staff sergeants to the next grade and promote fully eligible sergeants and staff sergeants who enlist 24 future soldiers to basic combat training in a 12-month period. As of today, we have 21 promotions in this category. In addition to the investment and professional development of our people, we continue to leverage our soldier referral program where soldiers from around the globe in every formation have an opportunity to contribute to recruiting efforts. This program is a little more than 20 months old and we've already received more than 77,000 referrals from soldiers, resulting in 5,000 contracts and many more in the pipeline. The Army addressed the medical backlog and surged over 60 medical providers to 33 select military entrance processing stations across the country, increasing enlistments for the Army, Army Reserve, and our sister services. Our wonderful providers completed 6,000 more physicals as compared to last year. The Army is paving the way in other avenues for young Americans to serve. A first-of-its-kind, life-accelerating program started in 2022, the Future Soldier Prep Course. Invest in young men and women, helping them unlock their potential and achieve academic and fitness readiness for military service, with a graduation rate over 90% in both academic and physical tracks. With recruiting transformation, marketing efforts are even getting better. Throughout fiscal year 24, our teammates at the Army Enterprise Marketing Office built upon the Be All You Can Be campaign while synchronizing marketing and advertising efforts to reach expanded audiences and connect, connect with more prospects interested in military service. Our recruiting staff and innovation team have been hard at work to transform the enterprise's prospecting efforts and adapt to market expansion. We continue to look beyond the high school market and in fiscal year 24, had an average enlistment age of 22 years and four months, and this is going up. Also, one out of every five uh, enlistees has some college or is a college graduate. Our increased usage of digital job boards and rollout of the Go Recruit mobile app, which was a recruiter recommendation, uh, have improved our efforts immensely. We started Recruit 360 Pilot, a new AI prospecting experiment that utilizes machine learning and AI-assisted lead identification to enhance recruiter efficiency and focus on quality over quantity. So we're trying to get beyond the old days of high school lists and use AI to help us refine the uh, lead market of our qualified uh, applicants. Our investment in people and Army's investment in recruiting made fiscal year 24 a success. There are no words to express how proud I am of the hardworking recruiters that crushed it in every community. Compared to fiscal year 23, these young men and women increased productivity by 43%, an outstanding improvement. As we kick start 25, we will continue to invest in the people, maintain momentum, transform the enterprise, and innovate our workforce. The Secretary announced earlier this month the Army's enlistment goal for fiscal year 25 is 61,000 future soldiers with a delayed entry program target of 10,000. Our recruiters are already kicking it in high gear in fiscal year 25, and they're doing very well right now. Again, thanks again for your time. I look forward to your questions. I'll turn it over to my, my good friend, uh, Brigadier General a Amrine. Uh, of course, be all you can be. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm honored to speak on behalf of the Air Force Recruiting Service and provide you with an update of where the Air Force and Space Force stand as we concluded fiscal year 2024 and look to our FY25 goals. I'm proud to say that we have met our recruiting goals for FY24 across all components, the Active Duty Air Force, Air Force Reserve, the, the Air National Guard, and the Space Force. This is an incredible achievement, particularly in today's challenging recruiting environment where we face declining youth population, lack of familiarity, and intense competition from the private sector. I want to start by expressing my sincere appreciation for all the hard work, dedication, and commitment from every member of the Air Force Recruiting Service to include our reserve and guard partners who were instrumental in us achieving our Department of the Air Force goals. There was no one single element which got us across the line uh, this year, but rather a broader shift in how we approach recruitment. Multiple levers, such as barrier removal, incentive adjustment, increasing medical uh, review support, and a honed focus on recruiter development all played a critical role to our total force recruiting successes as we closed out this fiscal year. This was a blend of Department of the Air Force Headquarters senior support from SAFMR, Half A1, Space Force S1, Half SJ, 
SG, not to mention Secretary Kendall, General Alvin, and General Salzman. Additionally, Air Education and Training Command Commander Lieutenant General Robinson has been a zealot on barrier removal and resourcing support. Our success is a testament to our collective effort and unwavering commitment to bringing in the best and brightest talent into our Air Force and Space Force. I need everyone to know the Department of the Air Force is still hiring. We have full and part-time opportunities in more than 130 specialties, several with bonuses. We put in place new incentives and modernized outdated policies beginning in the spring of 2023, bringing in a larger pool of qualified applicants. As of 30 September, more than 10,000 total force airmen and guardians joined the Air Force or Space Force due to policy changes and incentives implemented by the Air Force's recruiting cross-functional team. By eliminating these barriers, we've optimized our recruitment requirements without sacrificing the quality and capabilities of our recruits. Some of the changes that have expanded accession opportunities attracting high quality youth include reinstating the enlisted college loan repayment program, modifying the body composition program to the baseline DOD instruction, revising the tattoo policy and continuing uh, the Air Force THC pilot that does not disqualify high quality applicants if they test positive on their initial test and negative on a follow on test during the application process. In 2024, I adjusted the legal permanent resident requirement in the Air Force from 10 years to two years to align with DOD allowances. We also reviewed our medical policies and processes. The implementation of MHS Genesis and the Health Information Exchange complicated the medical accession process by increased workloads in reviewing potentially disqualifying conditions in applicants versus the pre-MHS Genesis. This created a large increase in medical waiver requests and caused applicant waiting time for waiver adjudications to increase significantly. Late last fall, AFRS added 63 medical administrator contractors to help gather and screen supporting medical records, increasing efficiency and allowing for recruiters to focus more on face-to-face -face engagements with applicants. Additionally, we bolstered recruiter training and made adjustments to goaling methodologies. The Department of the Air Force has not changed its high standards nor compromised the caliber of our applicants. Rather, we have expanded the opportunities for qualified individuals to join our ranks. We have partnered with military-affiliated or organizations to leverage their presence and manpower in communities across the country. The Air and Space Force Association, or AFA, has become one of our trailblazing partners in this effort, as this is an exciting opportunity to build our recruiting network beyond our traditional recruiting force. This year, we have also launched a similar partnership with Civil Air Patrol, which has the potential to expand our reach and add another 30,000 members to our total force outreach network. As we celebrate the success, we must also turn and focus to the future. FY25 brings with it an increased enlisted recruiting goal of 32,500 for the regular Air Force and a uh, Space Force increase by 30%. Additionally, Air Force Reserve requirements will also increase from 7,200 to 7,600. Achieving these goals depends on our ongoing commitment to investing in both our recruiters and the resources they need to succeed. The Department of the Air Force allocated more than 370 additional recruiting personnel based on manpower studies, RAN reports, and the AETCA-9 analysis. Air Force Recruiting Service is in the process of rapidly onboarding these personnel with deliberate placement uh, in, in and around uh, the United States. As we move forward, these goals set before us in FY25 are ambitious, but we believe they are achievable. Make no mistake, we cannot take our hand off the throttle and we must remain laser focused on mission. In the end, deterring or winning future conflicts in a time of consequence starts right here at home by winning in, co in the competition space for talent. With continued innovation, dedication, and a relentless commitment, to our excellence, we will bring in the talent of our Air Force, be that REGAF, Guard, or Reserve, as well as the Space Force, and what they need to meet the challenges for tomorrow. Thank you. I welcome your questions. Aim high and Semper Supra. Sir, over to you. Awesome. Good afternoon. I'm Rear Admiral Jim Waters. I'm Commander Navy Recruiting Command. It's a privilege to be here this afternoon to talk about the Navy's recruiting efforts over the last year and to outline uh, some of our goals for fiscal year 2025. We know that to remain the most capable Navy in the world, we must recruit the best of America, building pathways for all qualified Americans who choose to serve our nation. Fiscal year 2024 was a year of significant achievement for Navy recruiting due to the hard work and dedication of our recruiters, our leadership, and support teams across the country. 
Together, we contracted 40,978 active component enlisted sailors into the Navy against a goal of 40,600. This was no small feat, and I want to take a moment to recognize the frontline Navy recruiters who worked tirelessly to meet our goals. They did an outstanding job navigating a highly competitive recruiting market. And their efforts are a testament to the Navy's commitment to building a talented, mission-ready force. This success didn't happen by chance. It was the result of strategic changes we made to adapt to the current recruiting environment. Key adjustments included increasing the number of recruiters by approximately 800 and removing bureaucratic barriers to rapid decision making and contracting. When we take care of our recruiters, they take care of the mission. Because we recognize that today's recruits are engaging online more than ever, we ramped up our presence on social media, expanded our esports efforts, and employed creative talent in our award-winning Sailor vs. YouTube series. Additionally, our marketing and advertising efforts focused on real, authentic stories from actual sailors addressing perceived barriers, concerns, and key motivators related to joining. Another major initiative in fiscal year 2024 for the Navy was the establishment of our Recruiting Operations Center, or ROC, which has proven invaluable. The ROC consolidated our data and analytic capacity into a single source of truth to continuously assess and improve recruiting practices. This emphasis on shared learning and best practices is helping our, recruit, our recruiters meet their goals and it will continue to play a key role as we move forward in 2025. Finally, we streamlined our medical waiver process to make well-informed decisions in zero to three days, giving recruiters and candidates the opportunity to act quickly. As we turn our attention to fiscal year 2025, I want to note that while we're coming off a successful year, we are not taking our foot off the gas. Our goal for fiscal year 2025 is to build on our momentum and recruit another 40,600 new sailors, which reflects the growing needs of the Navy as we continue to modernize and strengthen our capabilities. The road ahead won't be without obstacles. As my uh, fellow recruiting commanders have noted, the labor market re remains competitive and military service is one of many options available to young Americans today. To stand out, we'll continue to refine our message, positioning the Navy as a premier opportunity for professional development, education, and service to the nation. And while mindful of evolving societal expectations, especially with regards to work-life balance and career flexibility, we will continue to highlight the opportunity for each young American to forge a better version of themselves in America's Navy. In the end, I'm optimistic about the year ahead. Fiscal year 2025 will bring its own set of challenges, but with the strategies we've implement implemented and the talent we have in place, I'm confident we will meet our goals. Thank you. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow military leaders, it's a pleasure to appear before you today to provide an update of your Marine Corps' recruiting efforts. Your Marine Corps exists to fight and win our nation's battles, and our performance in recruiting speaks for itself. Our combat heritage is embedded within Marine Corps Recruiting Command's DNA, and we share the same fierce competitive spirit to win as those Marines who've gone before us, no matter the challenge. Over the past several decades, the Marine Corps has made institutional investments into recruiting to ensure that we are resourced with the very best commanders, and Marine recruiters to accomplish this demanding mission. This has been, and will continue to be, our greatest source of strength as we face what some refer to as the most challenging recruiting environment since the inception of the all-volunteer force. Marine recruiters will continue to meet the expectations of our nation by holding true to our warrior's ethos and our core values of honor, courage, and commitment. We compete for the very best young people in every zip code in our nation. And our, our Marine recruiters are actively attracting and inspiring young men and women of character eager to take up the challenge of earning the title Marine. While we welcome all qualified and motivated applicants to take up this challenge, 
We refuse to lower our standards. We understand that to meet the high, almost mystical expectations that the American people have of their Marine Corps, that we must continue to attract and inspire young men and women of character who desire to live a life of significance by becoming a U.S. Marine. Despite our success in fiscal year 24, we continue to face the same challenges as the other services. Historic lows in qualification rates, low propensity to serve, a challenging labor market, and a fragmented media landscape continue to have a compounding effect on the recruiting environment. To combat these conditions, Marine Corps Recruiting Command will do what Marines have always done, innovate, adapt, and win. As such, we are focused on my priorities of one, training the most proficient recruiting force in the world, two, manning all of our recruiting sectors, three, securing resources to support our people in the field, and four, adapting our geographic laydown to reflect the changing demographics of our nation. And we're moving out at speed to make these organizational changes. As we attack in the fiscal year 25, we will continue to reinforce and expand the trust of the American people in their Marine Corps, positively shape the future of the Marine Corps, and enable our Marines and their families to be happy and successful. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Semper Fidelis. Thank you very much to all of our panelists today. We'll start with Associated Press, Lita Baldor. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I don't know, Dr. Helen, if you can answer this or if this is each one of you needs to answer. Um, I'm wondering about bonuses. Can you tell me how much overall the Defense Department has increased the amount of money it's providing to the services for bonuses and other sort of monetary um, enhancements for the services to provide for recruiting <coughs> last year over this year? If you can give sort of overall or if the services need to, to provide their own. And then uh, Admiral Waters for the, for the Navy. Can you uh, say whether or how closely the Navy is tracking the CAT 4s that you have been bringing in over the last year or so to determine whether or not there are any increased disciplinary or other issues with that sort of larger chunk that, you've, that the Navy's been bringing in that the other services have not done? So I'll actually uh, open it up to the services to talk to on, on bonus incentives. Yeah, ma'am, I don't have the exact amount, but this is one of the areas that the, in terms of transformation, should we do the same thing that we've been doing every year? So we're looking at a, a potential pilot to a way bonus versus station of choice. And what we're seeing is applicants are moving towards the station of choice. With that has garnered savings. I don't have the final amount, but it is a sizable when you you look at the, the total number of applicants and let's say it, it could be an estimate from you know three to five or six thousand dollars each so that's one of the areas that when we look at transformation how can we do something different and I think it's yielding I mean what we're seeing is applicants prefer uh, duty station of choice over money and I'll follow up uh, with my colleague. We can get you the specific number. Uh, what we do, though, is um, is that the the incentive options that are there um, they do and can flex throughout the requirements from the Air Force, specifically um, AFSCs or Air Force Specialty Codes. And so, um, you know, what we have seen is a uh, is a shift in my time, a little over uh, a year. Um, focusing on some of the most high demand um, and, and low density jobs that are out there, specifically in our special warfare uh, at atmosphere for, the, for those uh, Air Force specialty codes. And so, um, you know, in, in, in many cases, uh, several AFSCs are all uh, eligible for a bonus, but the structure of this is, is, is always flexing based on um, the, uh, the highest um, or the most demand AFSCs right now for us, that is special warfare and a lot of our um, open and mechanical uh, uh, AFSCs, ma'am. Yeah, so like the other services, we uh, look at each rating uh, to specifically allocate uh, enlistment bonuses. Uh, but the short answer to your primary question is there hasn't been a significant change in the bonus amount uh, going from 24 to 25. And with respect to the cat boards, we're tracking that closely. Uh, we've seen no uh, increase in attrition, no increase in disciplinary actions. And I attribute that mainly to the fact that every recruit that comes into the Navy 
meets the standard for the rating to which they are assigned. So the, the CAT4 is from the AFQT, which is four parts of the ASVAB. Each rating has a, very, is a combination of scores from, the, from those four plus the other six parts of the ASVAB, and that has never changed. So a Cat 4 sailor that comes in with an AFQT of 22 that's going to go be a uh, machinist mate meets all of the line requirements for that machinist mate and always has. We have not changed that. And, and ma'am, the Marine Corps does not rely on bonuses to attract and inspire young men and women of character to take up the challenge of becoming Marines. That said, we do have some new incentives for some new career fields. Uh, this year, we have $15,000 bonuses for electronic uh, maintenance, cyber and crypto operations, and information and communication tech career fields. But again, we don't rely primarily on bonuses. Thank you all. Yes, ma'am. Audit Director Litsa Pensland, thanks so much for doing this. I have a quick follow up. I just wanted to make sure I have this correct. So, the Army and the Air Force Space Force is increasing their goal for 2025, Navy staying the same. And then I didn't hear Major General Bowers what the Marine Corps was doing for 2025. Our goal is increasing by approximately 1,800 Marines. Okay, 1,800 Marines. Okay, uh, great, thanks. And then um, separately, um, Dr. Helen, you mentioned declining eligibility, and I was just wondering if there were any specific efforts to get after that, and specifically in terms of previous drug, drug use. I know there was a provision in the 25 NDAA that would stop the services from requiring someone to um, test for marijuana before enlisting. You know, what does the DOD think about that provision, if you could provide? any more guidance there. Certainly. Um, yeah, when we look at eligibility, um, based on estimates, about 23% uh, of youth are eligible to enlist without a waiver. That's for any of our, our various standards, whether they medical, dependents, moral. Um, so with regards to medical standards, it's something the department continually looks at um, and looks at advances in medical science, looking at the data for those who've come in with waivers to see if, if we can refine the medical standards. We've also so um, instituted a, a medical accessions records pilot, where for at this point now 50 con 51 conditions that used to have uh, most of them had any history of a particular condition. Uh, we're testing the feasibility of reducing the time frame for those conditions. ADHD has actually been um, one where we've seen a lot of individuals come in under that MARP condition. Um, we've also seen great success as we talked through the future sailor, future soldier prep course um, to invest in those individuals with potential to get them to whether it be the body composition or, or some of our academic standards as well. Um, with regards to drugs, um, certainly uh, marijuana is still uh, prohibited for our federal employees and, and we'll have to follow, continue to follow federal law. Thank you very much. Let's go to Haley. Thank you. Thank you all for doing this. Um, Dr. Helen, you mentioned that uh, for the first time since the metric has been tracked that there is a percentage of youth who are not even considering military service. Can you say how long, for how long has that metric been tracked? Um, I'll have to go back and double check, but I, I think it's uh, mid like 2010 or so. Okay, so roughly like at least a decade. At least a decade, okay. yes, yes. Um, and then uh, I, th I, I apologize, I don't remember who mentioned MHS Genesis, but that was, uh, I'm curious kind of what you've seen as the trend of that. I know that that was a pretty significant issue for a lot of recruiters and a lot of uh, recruits of just the challenges that MHS Genesis presented. So can you kind of talk through, are you still seeing those challenges? Are those being addressed? What does that sort of look like in, uh, now that we've kind of gotten further away from its implementation? Sure. sure. So yes, when we rolled out MSH Genesis, which is the department's electronic health record system, and when we rolled it out at uh, across MEPCOM that provided us access to the verifiable uh, health records, um, which meant we now have a lot of information on our young adults to assess them against our medical standards. Um, that did increase our workloads given the sure volume of information that was available through those health information exchange. Um, but we've been able to implement um, technical solutions. One of the key ones was instituting natural language processing um, to go through and, and pick out key elements that have helped us reduce the time frame. Um, we also overhauled recently our whole pre-screen process, so that's the process where we're reviewing the documentation and then giving them the approval, our applicants, uh, to, to go to the various MEPs. Um, through our overhaul of the process, now 80% 
of our applicants are cleared to go to MEPS within 48 hours of starting that pre-screen process. Um, and then for those 20% that have more complex medical histories, we've reduced the time frame where it used to be about 29 days on average to get them to uh, Florida MEP MEPS. We're now down to below seven. So we're continuing to improve our processes. And with MSH Genesis, we're able to leverage technology more to automate more processes. Um, but we've also brought in more staff as well and working to increase the staff to address the workload. All right, let's go to the phones here. Heather Mangilio, USNI News. Great, thank you so much. So I guess one of my biggest questions that I'm trying to still figure out when talking about recruiting, is it that there are a lot more people who are propens to serve right now, or is it that the different services have found that they were having roadblocks preventing people from enlisting? I, I guess I'm trying to figure out, are there just more people interested in that's who you tapped into, or was there a problem with the way the services were recruiting that created the services not meeting the goals the past two years? Certainly, I can jump in and then and then turn it over. But when we look at on aggregate our measure of propensity, which is a snapshot in time when someone takes a survey, we have seen stability in a low. Uh, metric for propensity. We're about 10% of young adults are, are motivated to serve. That has not changed over the past few years. Um, what we are seeing is propensity growing at an individual level, right? When our recruiters get out there and make contact um, with the individual, they can grow propensity one person at a time. Uh, that's where we, where I believe we are seeing success is, uh, is the operations and what we've been able to get back into communities where when you think about what happened during COVID, we had to pull out of communities for almost two years. It takes time to get back in and develop those relationships again. But again, I think this is what we're seeing as a testament to our recruiting commanders and the hard work of our recruiters. Yeah, Dr. Hill, if I could add, uh, you're absolutely right. I, I think not having our superstar recruiters in high schools across the nation uh, for two, uh, some two and a half years has certainly had an impact in really bringing awareness. And the face-to-face -face interaction really helps to fill knowledge gaps about the, you know, for in our case, the United States Army. And so that awareness is uh, also impacts, you know, their desire to say, well, should I consider service? We have a declining veteran population. Yeah, I grew up uh, and, you know, with a family of uh, many veterans in Wisconsin you know, who either served in World War II or Korea or Vietnam, and they were all there to answer my questions. Now with the decreasing veteran population, that is also really impacting, I think, that knowledge base and pro propensity of those, those up-and-coming uh, qualified, uh, you know, military uh, servicemen and women. Yeah. And if I could add, I think with uh, uh, Dr. Helen's comments on, I mean, 30 years ago, uh, if you asked somebody if they had a family member, 45 hands would go up. And if you ask now, it's somewhere between, you know, 10 and 12 uh, or so. Um, and so, and it, it, it is what it is. But what I would say is one of the focus areas and, and uh, for, um, for the Air Force and Space Force is, uh, is building back that familiarity because over time that created this lack of familiarity. And then you have these exacerbating incidents like COVID that, that materialized. But, but this has been a focus point. And, um, and I know that, uh, you know, we all spoke to this uh, last fall as well as, as all of the services are really uh, focusing on that, um, that lack of familiarity and getting back out into the, uh, the public and getting it one, whether it's one person, one touch point is a time uh, that General Davis said, um, or expanding social media campaigns uh, to to meet the uh, this generation where they are, um, but but I think that for the Air Force aspect of it, it is a deliberate line of effort for us is is expanding um, that total force outreach or recruiting network to be able to build back that familiarity uh, into America. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's important in this to not equate low propensity with high anti-military sentiment. It's really an expression of lack of knowledge, lack of familiarity, to, to play off my uh, shipmate here. Um, and, and I think to answer uh, a little bit more of the, of the question that was asked, uh, to say this reflects an increased number of recruiters. I mean, the Navy added recruiters, other services added recruiters, and it also reflects the, the recognition that we, we need to increase propensity one American at a time. It's that 
prospecting work that's done by recruiters to go out not only in the schools but at career fairs and uh, making phone calls uh, social media connections all of it to build that human to human relationship that leads to a young American recognizing the value of service and then making a commitment to it let's go back out to the phone here Jeff Shogel task and purpose uh, thank you a question for Dr. Helland about um, the medical session records pilot or MARP uh, so as you mentioned it's now up to about uh, 51 conditions do you uh, foresee this as the start of something that becomes permanent, a change to military accession regulations uh, that uh, makes it easier for people with previously disqualifying medical conditions to enlist without having to get a waiver first? Thank you. Yeah, so the, the whole intent of this is write a pilot to test the feasibility if we can shorten these time frames um, and with the data then to make that decision to then modify um, our, our medical accession standards. So that's where we're in right now, that, that pilot phase. Largely we are seeing positive results um, and we'll continue to monitor the data. So ultimately again, um, to make that decision to uh, about these conditions on whether we can build them into our, our uh, standards instruction. Let's go out to Steve Benyon, Military Times. Hey, appreciate y'all for doing this. Uh, quick question for uh, the services minus the Army and Navy. Uh, those services have seen a lot of uh, good early data on the prep courses. Uh, nearly a quarter of the Army recruits uh, at FY24 did one of those uh, prep courses. Uh, as the uh, Air Force or Marine Corps looking into establishing uh, their version of that? And Space Force as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question. Um, from a holistic perspective across the Department of the Air Force for recruiting, uh, I would offer the answer is no. Uh, there's not there's not the overarching compelling requirement that we've seen. However, I would say that for our special warfare um, uh, a session pipeline, we do have a very deliberate development uh, program for them. So as folks identify uh, or are uh, interested in the special warfare uh, uh, Air Force specialty codes. Um, there is a very deliberate development program, uh, both um, from a uh, you know from a mental resiliency uh, standpoint, but also uh, a very in-depth uh, training, uh, physical training regimen to prepare them for that pipeline. Yes, in the Marine Corps, we are not looking at starting a special program for future Marines. We have the delayed entry program that's working very well for us. Louis. Thank you. Um, number one, how cold is this room for you guys right now? Because <laughs> I, I am freezing. Um, I, I just want to follow up on Steve's question here because it was almost related exactly to that. But I'm going to direct my question to the Army and uh, the Navy about the future sailor, future soldier prep course. Can you confirm the numbers uh, of how many of your recruits this year uh, actually participated in that? And having heard the other two services, why did the Navy choose to follow what the Army uh, program was? Um, and was it based on their success? Uh, or what did you find that, yes, we did have a base that really needed, that was of motivated individuals who wanted to join the Navy, who just needed that extra uh, incentive? To, and then I have a follow-up. Yeah. So, so thanks for that. And the, uh, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. Uh, for how many went through for the two future sailor prep course physical or academic uh, but but the reason that we followed the army on this was because of their great success I mean uh, General Davis talked about the percentages it was a wonderful uh, example and what we found especially for uh, on the side of future sailor prep course physical which allows us to bring some folks in that are above body fat standards uh, by up to 6% and, and have them work with our uh, re recruit division commanders. Um, we had a lot of highly qualified, like nuclear trained operator qualified uh, individuals that couldn't quite get there. Uh, and so when we saw that the Army was using that, uh, we took it on and we're 100% we're successful on getting folks th through that uh, course. We have a few that have tapped out because they just, this isn't for me, but anybody that was working toward 
that body fat standard has made it and is in recruit training. And what we found is s those sailors are committed in a way that's above and beyond the average that's in recruit training command. And many of them have gone on to leadership positions within their recruit divisions. Future Sailor Prep Course Academic uh, allowed us to uh, provide an opportunity for young Americans to expand the opportunities within the Navy. As I mentioned before, every rating, all of them are based on individual line scores. And so by giving them some more academic training in recognition that much of America had challenges with COVID in schools to, to increase that opportunity and give them the opportunity to have more choice and we can fill other ratings that we wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, that's why we followed the Army. Yeah, if I could uh, answer uh, the data. So Future Soldier Prep course uh, for us is about 20, 21 months. Uh, total number of graduates, we're approaching uh, 28, over 28,188. Now that's, that's just more than Comp 1. So now I'm t when I talk about that number, that's active duty Army, Reserve, and National Guard. So they all benefit. Uh, in the total army uh, with the future soldier prep course. For us, from last year's mission of uh, 55,000, over 10,326 uh, graduated the course. We already have another uh, pending, uh, uh, shipped already to uh, Fort Jackson, about 1,500, and another you know, 3,000 over the next you know, quarter, so into the new year. So we are filling all of the seats because of demand. So let me go back to why we're seeing the success. When we saw the during COVID the, the drop in test uh, ASVAB by like 10 points, that's the segment, and it wasn't you know recruiting command, it was actually our training and doctrine command, uh, Lieutenant Gervais uh, and team that said, hey, the Army's done this before. We saw this drop. Why don't we go uh, and try to invest in that segment? And some, I mean, half of them were within five points of a uh, fully meeting, you know, three Bravo or Alpha, which allows to open up many job opportunities. And so that's what we invested in, and that's why we see this transformational success. Some of them are testing out within uh, two weeks, uh, and to some of them are testing to the highest category. So now every job in in the Army is now open to them, just from uh, classroom, not um, you know from an outside agency. Of course, the camaraderie, uh, like students, the uh, physical fitness, uh, academic training every day is I think is building this uh, this great cohort of future uh, soldiers. Now, what I recommend everybody take an opportunity and visit the Future Soldier Prep Corps if they, if they haven't uh, down at Fort Jackson. It will be an eye open. I've been many times. It is, uh, I love it. It's, uh, it's a great course. And my follow up is, do you, do you plan to now expand uh, the course as, as it continues to get one in five uh, so new recruits in? Yes. And, and also, what do you attribute the rise in age to, you said that your average age now is 22 point. Yeah, so two years, four months. Yeah, yeah so I, I don't know in terms of expansion because we want to go after that labor market, expanded market. The segment that is, you know, within 10 points or that, that whatever, the 21 to, uh, to 30, uh, we think they can test up. Uh, so I don't think we're going to expand that based on what we're seeing. Now, let's go to the, uh, this expanded market. What, what I'm hearing from recruiters is that um, – Many are, you know, graduating high school and are going on to college, and and maybe that's not for them. Uh, and and what our recruiters are doing is really beginning to focus on that uh, that segment of the population is really starting to pay off. Why are they focusing on that? Because re when we were short in terms of what we're bringing in to the army, we needed to fill training seats so basic training battalions can be filled. And we weren't filling them, so our recruiters weren't going to the high schools because they won't ship until the next year. So they're going directly into the labor market, and that uh, has really, bl uh, uh, really blossomed for us over the last two years. And I want to say to the, our recruiters, job well done. Let's get, let's stay at it. 
uh, and this the current delayed entry program it the the I think the average age is about 22 um, years and five months so it's it I see it uh, going up uh, and the, the high school market as we see the student you know population let's say decline over time we're going to have to expand it into the labor market or the some college or college market one more yes sir John Seward notes um, on the prep courses for both services <coughs> what are you all seeing in terms of retention after initial contract um, and then uh, a similar sort of related follow-up for all services which is in terms of finding qualified a applicants, where does physical fitness rank uh, as far as challenge? So as far as the um, future sailor uh, prep course, um, the physical fitness part of it has been, um, it, it is something of a challenge to make sure that we're, we've got the right uh, fitness for uh, folks uh, joining the Navy uh, but it's not one that's insurmountable and the physical part the future sailor prep course physical has given us uh, the ability to really uh, get after that especially in our um, our ratings that require a much much higher end uh, ASVAB score uh, to get after so for the Army, uh, Army Research Institute is tracking every graduate. So you need more time. It's about 20 months. So we do have a large a number of graduates. And what we want to do longitudinally is really find out from an academic perspective if that uh, it impacts retention uh, as they go on to the first duty station. For the fitness, that's, a, I mean, a really good question. And we're thinking through that because we know that in the – uh, future soldier prep course, they lose about 1.2 percent uh, body fat a week, and what we want to make sure is we keep tracking them as they move on to uh, their first duty station and and figure out in terms of retention. So are they continuing on this this right path? Are they are they uh, going down or are they going up? So that's what we're we're tracking because we we really need that data to figure out. Hey, is this so transformational that we need to look at you know other uh, expansion opportunities. Yeah, so I think some of that's because of the length of time that we've been running the Future Sailor Prep course hasn't been significant enough to really get after that. But I can say that our attrition rates in boot camp and A school for this cadre, both physical and academic, are on par. There's no change for that group relative to the rest of them. And just there to follow for all services. Yeah. yeah. Where does physical yeah. fitness rank so, in terms of uh, here for the Air Force? I mentioned in my opening statement that uh, over the over the past year we adjusted. It, the Air Force actually had a higher than DoD standard, and we aligned with the DoD standard. Um, since then. We brought in over 5,800 airmen uh, under that DOD standard. We've had one uh, washout of uh, BMT for physical fitness reasons. And so, um, so I, I think it's, you know, from that standpoint, um, and, and the, I will tell you, we get the question a lot, hey, have you changed the standard? Well, the PFT standards have not changed for our basic training. And, uh, and that, that small policy adjustment uh, offered uh, 5,800 very high quality folks to come into our service and we lost one person for it. Thanks. Okay, thanks for the question. So Marine Corps recruit training is 13 weeks long. It is the toughest, most physically demanding of the entry level training of the services. So physical fitness is therefore very important to us. This is the value of our delayed entry program. We like every applicant to spend at least 30 days in the delayed entry program so we can work with them, they can work with their recruiter, and we can get them in good physical shape to improve their chances of success at recruit training. The delayed entry program has an additional benefit for us. While these kids are getting in good shape working with their recruiters, they bring their friends along. And 25% of our contracts, one out of four, comes from a referral from the delayed entry program. Our Marines love the opportunity to have a delayed entry program to work with their own little squad or platoon of recruits. And this gets to propensity. You know, we like to replace propensity with inspired. So if only 9% of the population is propensed, 91% is just waiting to be inspired. What a golden opportunity. So this is the value of our delayed entry program. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Really want to uh, say thank you to our distinguished defense leaders, panelists today, uh, as they talk about uh, our efforts to improve uh, our recruiting and service goals for fiscal year 25. Thank you very much. This concludes our press briefing.